Very good, very good. Um, let me introduce myself because I think that we have a, 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 an audience today that um, includes a lot of people that haven't normally joined us. So uh, my name is Christopher Finsk. I'm Dean of uh, the Division of European Graduate School. That's entitled Philosophy, Art and Critical Thought. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to, um, to be hosting this event or to be welcoming you to this event, which has um, been put together on the occasion of the publication of a collective book devoted to the work of Svetan Ugrijic. Um, we are delighted to welcome back to the EGS. Um, he has been with us before and he's a, a valued uh, associate. Uh, this book is edited by Svetlana Gavrilovich and Sasha Ilich, um, and it's entitled, it's entitled Writer, Astronomer, and Terrorist. And we, uh, um, it, it, it addresses many dimensions of, of Satan's work, including the political um, or, or cultural uh, activism. The, um, th th we have assembled a group, an international group, to uh, hold this discussion. It will be moderated by uh, Dr. Nemanja Mitrovic, uh, who is on your screen. And it will include um, Branislav Yakovlevich, uh, Davor Beganovic, and please excuse me for this terrible pronunciation of, of your names, but um, I, I, will, I still want to <laughs> at least do this. Um, Olga Ma uh, Manojlovic Pintar, Olivera Stojic Rakic, and Goran Lazicic. And we also are, again, honored to have Seitan Ubijic himself um, in, in this group. So um, Nemanja Mitrovic will be uh, uh, directing the discussion. And at this point, uh, I simply want to pass the screen to him and, again, um, convey to you my, my pleasure and the sense of uh, being honored um, to, uh, by, by this, uh, I'm honored for the EGS. Uh, by this occasion. It's, 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 it's an, uh, uh, I think, an important event for us. So, um, Nemanja, would you like to begin then? Uh, thank you, Chris. And just before we start, I would like to thank you because uh, uh, this event uh, would not be possible without uh, your generous help and uh, support. And also, as you said, the occasion for this event is the publication of a book entitled uh, Sreten Ulicic, Writer, Astronomer, Terrorist. And um, today you will be able to meet and hear various authors who contributed to this book. Um, on the EGS website, uh, you have a text written by uh, Sasha Ilic, which describes the chain of events that led to Sreten Ulicic's boosting from the position of Director of National Library of Serbia. And before we begin this talk, I will just offer a short summary of everything that happened. So in 2012, after uh, Boris Tadic, then in the capacity of president of the Republic of Serbia, attended the celebration of Republika Srpska's 20th anniversary in January of 2012, a stash of arms was found in Banja Luka, in Banja Luka Hall, Boric. And after that, Montenegrin writer Andrei Nikolaides published a provocative text about these two events. This text uh, entitled Beautifying a Monster was published by E. Novine. And two days after the anniversary, it sparked the harangue against Nikolaidis that swiftly transferred to the Serbian media mainstream. In reaction to this, first proclamation of the writer's forum was drafted. And the aim of its signatories was to distance themselves from Tadic state policy toward the region and warn of the serious encroachment on the freedom of public speech in the case of Andrei Nikolaidis. One of the people who signed this proclamation was Sretin Ugricic, Serbian writer, philosopher, and at that time, director of National Library of Serbia. The explosion in the media 
took place immediately after the proclamation became public. Newsstands throughout the country displayed the new issue of the daily press with a large picture of Svete Nugicic on the front page and a caption in capital letters saying, National Library Director supports attempt on Tadic's life. What followed was a long day of media barrage fire at Svete Nugicic, the forum and at the National Library. At one point, some tabloid journalists even climbed the nearby trees and the facade of the library building, hoping for a snapshot of Ugrichic. For them, at that moment, every single piece of information was important since what the public was actually watching was a reality show of catching a terrorist. Ivica Dacic, leader of the Socialist Party of Serbia, party whose former president was Slobodan Milosevic, commented on the views of the library director in the following way. Svete Nugucic can support that, but from a prison, not from the position of a library administrator. Medi media pressure increased so much that even the library's director inbox was hacked to obtain his letter to the writer's forum confirming, confirming his signature of its first proclamation. This Ugucic circular mail, including electronic addresses of writers forum members was published by the press on 20th January, 2012. After several rebellious days caused by Ugucic's refusal to yield to lies, imputations and persecution of those criticizing the recurrence of Milosevic's policy in Bosnia, Svetlin Ugrichis was relieved of duty on 20th of January at the telephone session of the government. The final score of all these events was catastrophic, primarily for the National Library of Serbia, which having lost an excellent leadership entered a long period of stagnation and deterioration coinciding with the collapse of the fragile democracy in the country established after the year 2000. Boris Tadic lost the May of elections, May elections, while Sretan Ugricic, as a victim of political ostracism, was forced into voluntary exile lasting to this day. As we said in the announcement in this time, when Western democracy faces a resurgence of threats, that it has not witnessed for over a half a century, this story that's going to be told today could be instructive and act as a warning. Participants of this event will consider how the blacklisting and eventual oosting of certain Ugrich's exemplified the mechanisms of repression that govern one specific society, Serbian society. Some of them, will also give due attention to his important literary and philosophical works. Also, after we hear from all participants, we will answer questions from the audience. And just to tell you, in order to pose your questions, please use a Q&A box that you will find in Zoom toolbar on the uh, right-hand corner. Uh, our first speaker, for today is um, Olivera Stošić Rakić. Olivera was the editor of the literary and debate program of the Cultural Center of Belgrade at the time when all this was happening. Also in the period from 2006 to 2018. And Olivera is presently a freelance cultural manager. Olivera, I would like to ask you at the moment when all this was happening to Sretin, you were working at another cultural institution in Belgrade, Cultural Center of Belgrade. Can you describe us the context that enabled something like this to happen? Or better you need to unmute yourself. Uh,
on the okay sorry uh, first of all good evening i would like to thank the Re european graduate school for organizing this event and to all the webinar participants thanks nemanja in my presentation i will focus on some aspects of cultural policies and cultural policy of that period of time Yes, I, I worked continuously for more than two decades in a cultural institution founded by the city of Belgrade. <clears throat> its name it's, uh, is the Cultural Center of Belgrade. It is an interdisciplinary house of culture, which in terms of program content mainly deals with the presentation of contemporary artistic practices at the international level with over 300 programs per year. So it has a very dynamic program profile. At the same time, the program of this house tried to contribute to the insufficiently present public democratic dialogue in Belgrade and Serbia. They often send a clear message about the connections between public policy and cultural production, contrary to the unfortunately majority of the Serbian population who think that culture and public policies are not connected. And that together with numerous other reasons will exactly affect what happened to Ugricic, the National Library of Serbia, as well as unfortunately many other participants in the Serbian cultural field. Unlike uh, this majority, let's say romantic view of the position of culture and art in society, Serbian politicians are, of course, fully aware of the impact of the cultural system. After the fall of Milosevic and the establishment of democracy in Serbia, the government of Zoran Djidjic enabled people of proven professional qualities and new modern visions to come to key places in culture, so it was possible for Ugricic to become director of one of the main national institutions in 2001 with the assassination of Prime Minister Jinjic and the return or, let's say, strengthening of the nationalist political uh, current, even during the rule of the so-called democratic bloc, the cultural sector consequently lost its fragile independence. This, of course, happened in parallel, more or less, in all segments of social and public life. But in my text in, the, in this book, I focus on those levers of government power that were directly used for the purpose of controlling cultural institutions in period, period before and after Ugrich's dismissal. And they are such as appointment of management and supervisory boards of institutions, almost exclusively from the rank of associates and members of the ruling party or parties. Appointment of directors of institutions with the organizing of the open call, which was announced only formally. In fact, the con candidate who is a member of the ruling party is elected. Then there is the abuse of the instrument of uh, acting director which leads institution into a multi-layer temporary state. This abolishes its program independence and prevents the adoption of long-term work plans and strategies. In Belgrade, at one point uh, during Ucic's current government, out of 34 cultural institutions, 19 of them had almost simultaneous long-term long acting conditions, sometimes more than 10 years. The program budget has been constantly reduced, which has especially impoverished the independent cultural scene. A huge bureaucratization of the process of work in culture was imposed, which drastically reduced cultural production nationalist program agendas have been imposed, etc. All this caused censorship, but also self-censorship among cultural workers. Where solidarity would logically be expected, it was not enough. And uh, 
That is exactly another important reason why Ugritic case was also possible. We, the cultural workers, failed to unit, to create any kind of organization that would act against. I must emphasize that there were many attempts within the profession to organize a rebellion. I witnessed that myself, but it never materialized. Most people from the culture did not react to a British dismissal, and the Serbian Pen Center also fell silent. The only public gathering in terms of support to set a new retreat was organized at Cultural Center of Belgrade. There were 300 people present, which on the one hand is a quite a number. However, let's not forget that Belgrade is a city of 2 million people. In today's Serbia, the position of managers are taken by anonymous persons without appropriate work experience. Many places, places of production of culture and knowledge have been abolished. I see this as one of the disastrous consequences of the inability of the cultural sector of Serbia to unite and among other, other to prevent the removal of Sretan Ugricic. I would end with a quote from Sretan Ugricic text about the political future of Serbia. The answer to the question of what and how it should go further should be renewal of authentic anti-fascism as the first presupposition of ethics, as the first presupposition of every commitment and every value orientation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Olivera. Uh, my next question would be for Olga Manorovic Pintar, who is a, a senior research associate at the Institute for Eastern History of Serbia in Belgrade. And Olga, since Olivera described the culture and political context which surrounded Ugric's Usting from National Library, can you please situate this event in a broader context of uh, Serbian nationalist ideology? Mm. Well, thank you very much for this question. And uh, also I would like to thank for the organization of this event. But before I answer your question, I have to start with uh, something that happened a few hours ago uh, with the fact that the appeals chamber of the International Residual Mechanism for Crime Criminal Tribunals in The Hague confirmed the verdict sentencing Ratko Mladic, military leader of the Bosnian Serbs to life in prison for crimes committed in Bosnia and Herzegovina during the wars, war from 1992 till 1995. This was the last in a series of verdicts that alleged uh, that uh, legally convicted Bosnian Serb military and political leadership for war crimes uh, conducted, including the crime of genocide in Srebrenica uh, as one of the biggest and most important verdicts that were made uh, in The Hague. Of course, it is a coincidence that the verdict concerning the case of Ratko Mladic was announced on the day we found ourselves talking about the book that deals with the case with the affair, with the phenomenon, with the event, Ugricic, as the authors of these texts defined it. So I would like to ask the question at the beginning, is this fact a poetic justice? And you all who read this book and all who know about the event Ugricic knows that precisely this phrase, poetic justice, is used by one of the main characters of this book. And precisely this uh, uh, phrase started the avalanche that at the end removed Sretan Ugricic from the position of the director of National Library of Serbia and took him away from Serbia, from Belgrade and from his family. Of course, it is not, uh, I should say, uh, 
poetic justice uh, that we are talking about this book on a day when Ratko Mladic is finally sentenced for his crimes. But I believe that it is uh, intriguing to contemplate precisely on this phrase, poetic justice, and on the utopian ideals in the Balkans, and at the same time to contemplate on contemporary Western democracy, which is, as it is written in the announcement of our discussion today, facing a resurgence of threats that has not witnessed for over a half century. Once placed in a wider framework, as it was suggested, and viewed from the bird's eye perspective, as the description of this event suggests, Ugricic phenomenon can take on a different shape. It can allow for a many new viewpoints and interpretations on the current political and ideological problems. However, I think that the analysis of this inner structure must come from below. And um, no matter which perspective we choose in order to answer the question which Nemanja raised, how to situate this event in the broader context of Serbian nationalist ideology, I would say that once observed from the diachronic perspective, either global or local, it appears to be the pattern and not the excess in the Serbian history. It appears as a paradigm which reflects the long list of similar examples that both preceded and followed and that were all promptly disregarded and marked as treacherous in the public field in Serbia. Stigmatization of Sreten Ugricic was one of the boiling points in a long series of similar events whereby the former lords and hyenas of war were justified and their invented historical tradition legitimized. But it is at the same time unique unique case, and its uniqueness lies in the fact that it represented the watershed. After January 2012, it turned out that the dialogue and disputes, which were held in the public space in Serbia, which were somehow held in that public forum that was established and, did, and which was constantly shrinking, uh, after the fall of Slobodan Milosevic, that all those debates and uh, disputes, instead of strengthening the democratic, they actually reinforce the rigid autocratic principles and political practice in Serbia. And that's why I think it represents a very paradigmatic example, not only for Serbia, but for the wider European community in those last few days. Uh, years. During the first decade of the 21st century, in the post-Yugoslav, post-war, post-Milosevic transitional Serbia, debates and disputes which questioned and negated the idea of the supposed Serbian national unifications were framed inside the concept which is defined in whole Europe as facing the past or dealing with the past concept. However, the questions of individual or specific group guilt and uh, on the other side of the collective uh, responsibility were not only formal attempts to institutionalize the new politics of history in Serbia and the new ideological concept after the fall of Milosevic. They were not the reflections of the phenomenon which recently Lea David defined and strongly criticized in her book, The Past Can't Heal Us. And she pointed that those uh, phrases like, and concepts of moral rem uh, remembrance and the human rights, rights memorialization agenda, at the end did not turn out in a way how everybody thought they will. During the first years of 21st century, the majority of individuals and groups who from the margin of the political field critically pondered the cases, the ca causes and the consequences of the wars in which Yugoslavia was destroyed were preoccupied 
with the need to reveal the truth and clearly define the roles of the participants in the war and to unmask the regime that invented them and the system they created. They adopted the ethics of responsibility as a tool which enabled deeper digging into the past and better introspection. Not so numerous, but very influential artists, theorists, journalists, and activists initiated projects which were all aware of the limitations and pitfalls posed by the mere and only formal takeover of the facing the past concept. And precisely because of that, their search was focused on determining the precise chronology and the forensic examination of the crimes. Sreten Ugricic had a specific position in that group, let's say, of the intellectuals during those years. He was one of those, I should say, rare critical intellectuals who willingly adopted the official position of the director of one national institution of culture. And from that position, he strongly con actually promoted all these concepts of facing the past and that new uh, history of politics and um, politics of history at the same time. He strongly promoted, I should say, the concept of uh, which could be defined against impunity. Uh, and at the same time, institutions of mourning, bereavement, apology, remorse, regret, as crucial preconditions for the introduction of the sustainable post-conflict society and not the pillars of just another manipulative political system. In this way, the image of the past and positioning of its actors and at the same time of the new agents of uh, remembrance, of new agents of memory on those uh, war days appeared as very important ideological, I should say, components based on the clear recognition of the perpetrators and the regimes that abolished their uh, guilt. Ugricic was among those who questions and critically evaluated the avoidance and inability of the official Belgrade to take the strong stand and uh, unconditional and to unconditionally condemn the crimes committed in the Serbian name during the wars of the 90s. And he took uh, this position from as a, as a director of one national institution. He was convinced that, as in one of the interviews was said, that the enormous and desperate energy invested in the denials speaks of enormous fear of remorse and that remorse operated continuously and power, powerfully, only suppressed a level, level deeper from conscious into unconscious. It is not we who deny in that time, Sreten Ugricic says, I don't know if he will agree with that uh, uh, conclusion today, but our conscious, astonished by the weight of the burden it should carry. However, instead of adopting this approach and accusing the regime and especially individuals and their political groups who committed the crimes in Serbia, the hysteria of denial as Ugricic defined it, created a strong martyr narrative in Serbia on which the new social contract was reached. A new consensus was achieved during the last 10 years on the idea of the new national unification in the near and more distant future. The joint undertaking of nationalist elites on both sides of Drina River was renewed, although one cannot neglect the responsibility for their affirmation that bore their political predecessor who first engineered and then also conducted the wars of the 1990s. All the attempts to re-examine and reconsider the responsibility to punish those who were guilt to distance from the political concept that started the war were and are today completely abandoned. In all the texts of this volume, 
and some of those that were published in Serbia during the last decade. It is obvious that the celebration of the 20 years of the existence of the Republika Srpska uh, that Nemanja mentioned represented the turning point on several levels. The several years long attempts of the official Belgrade to maneuver in the process of history policy making proved to be extremely ineffective. The state officials constantly tried to satisfy and attract the far right and simultaneously were losing their original supporters. Furthermore, they were pushing them away from the principles on which the change of the regime became possible in the year uh, of 2000. The re-examination of responsibility and the guilt for the wars of the 1990s can, has been suppressed by the idea of the necessity to realize national unification, which essentially remained what it has been in fact during all these times, a screen for unscrupulous plunder and legitimization of private wealth gained through low breaking and war crimes. And I think the case, Ugricic case or the affair Ugricic or whatever we choose to define it, clearly reflects uh, this, uh, this statement. And at the end, allow me just to say that this book is not just a book, but I should say it is a project and it is masterfully complied by its editors, Svetlana Gavrilovic and Sasha Ilic. For me as a reader, and not only as one of the authors, it seemed as though they have used Eisenstein's editing method and masterfully led the reader, not only through one specific individual destiny, unique destiny of Sreten Ugricic, but through the social history of Serbia at the beginning of 21st century of post-war and post-conflict uh, Serbia. And just one more thing, to this conclusion, one must add the choice of wonderful thought-provoking photos made by Srđan Veljović that also perfectly framed text and captured the atmosphere. And I think this whole structure, uh, if we understand this book as a specific structure, will, in my opinion, represent a turning point or a nucleus for some new political, um, not only activism, but political framework that will start the new, um, historical introspection in Serbia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Uh, our third uh, participant in uh, this uh, discussion uh, will be uh, Goran Lazicic, who is currently a doctoral fellow of the Austrian Academy of Sciences at the Department of Slavic Studies at the University of Graz, Austria. Goran. Uh, literature of Svetin Ugricic is often, often described as a part of Serbian postmodernism. How would you situate Ugricic's work in the context of Serbian postmodernism? And does this Serbian version of postmodernism has any specific political traits? And in this context, what is the specificity of Ugricic's literary endeavor? Uh, thank you, Nemanja, for this introduction and for organizing this event, and most of all for your questions. But uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank Svetlana Gavrilovic and Sasha Ilic for inviting me to, to write an ar article for this volume. And also many thanks go to Branislav who for his comments and suggestions during my work on the, on the paper. And, uh, now to, to your questions, uh, uh, when it comes to the specificities of Serbian literary postmodernism, it is above all its complex and dynamic relationship with, uh, on the one hand, uh, Yugoslav late socialist, and on the other hand, the post-Yugoslav ethno-nationalist ideological and cultural paradigm in the period of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, during the 1980s, the postmodern literature was in the context of the so-called soft Yugoslav socialism. Now, 
in generally speaking, uh, although necessarily controlled, still allowed, and in certain aspect, I would say even a desirable type of prim primarily youth culture, uh, somewhat parallel to the new wave in music. And since the early 1990s, when the ethnic nationalism becomes dominant ideology, the position of postmodern literature changes and becomes more complex. Namely, it becomes evident that this type of literature can ideologically support the narratives of nationalism, but it can also subvert and deconstruct uh, uh, them. Uh, this, this is actually well known from the international theoretical debates on postmodernism, where some theorists see it as a left-wing and liberal uh, culture or art, and uh, the others uh, see it as a right-wing or, let's say, conservative uh, cultural doctrine. Uh, the topic of my essay was primarily the relationship between the postmodernism and nationalism. Uh, the focus was on the generation of writers to whom Svetin Ugricic, as a young author, belonged. And it was, uh, it was first of all, not a, a literary group in the classical sense, but in the literary criticism of that time, um, the unifying label of the so-called young Serbian prose fiction emerged and gradually established uh, itself. Uh, the literary of these authors relied mainly on the contemporary Western literary and philosophical influences, primarily Borges and American metafiction, and so that their works soon were recognized as postmodern literature. Uh, from the beginnings of his literary work, Sreten Ugricic doesn't belong to the mainstream of this group of young postmodernists. Uh, his first three published books, um, I will, uh, I will uh, read the original titles. I, uh, I, I'm not uh, prepared the translations of, of, of them. Uh, upoznavanje sa veštinom, ne, neponovljivo, neponovljivo, and Maja i ja i Maja, uh, the three books published between uh, 1985 and 1993, could be described as a neo-romanticist type of postmodernism. Uh, in the Belgrade literary magazine Delo, uh, Sreten Ugrić published in 1989 one of his programmatic autopoetical essays entitled Towards the Romanticism of the Late Postmodernism. Prema uh, romantizmu kasne postmoderne. The author conceives of the postmodern as a romantic inspired radicalizing of the contradictions of the Enlightenment. In this sense, he speaks of the postmodernism as a culturally renewing and reviving formation that comes after the collapse of modernity. Uh, in the influential anthology of Serbian postmodernism edited by Alexander Yerkov in 1992, Ugrišić is, for instance, classified into a poetically peripheral stream of Serbian postmodernism described as a new archaism. And, um, for instance, another literary critic dealing with this generation of authors, Tihomir Brajović, classifies the works of Sretan Ugričić as an intellectual experimental prose and connects it with authors such as, for instance, Pavle Ugrinov or Radomir Konstantinović. Uh, and now to take one step back, uh, when it comes to the Serbian literary postmodernism um, in general, in addition to this young generation of the 1980s, Another unavoidable name is uh, Milorad Pavic, an author and literary historian of an older generation. Above all, with his first novel, Dictionary of Hazards, published in 1984. Until the early 1990s, this novel had a wide international reception and is still considered as one of the relevant postmodern novels. But apart from, uh, lit from the literary postmodernism, uh, Milorad Pavic is an important figure for the analysis of the emergence of Serbian nationalism in the 80s in general, and of its rise into a dominant ideology in the early 1990s. 
uh, various elements in different aspects of nationalism can be found both in Pavic's literary works as well in his public statements, mostly in his open support for Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, in the introductory part of my essay, I take Pavic's example as one paradigm of the postmodern literature in Serbia. As the other opposing paradigm, I mark the one that continues the literary and intellectual heritage of Danilo Kish, a Serbian Jewish writer belonging to the same generation as Pavic, uh, primarily for his collection of short stories, A Tomb for Boris Davidovich, uh, night, published 1976, and his polemical essay, The Anatomy Lesson, uh, 1978. And relying on Svetlana Boim's distinction between the restorative and reflexive nostalgia, I marked these two paradigms as restorative and reflexive type of postmodern literature. The first of them being, uh, to put it uh, just simply uh, as possible, as simply as possible, conservative and compatible with the narratives in various aspects of nationalism. And the second one uh, being subversive, ironical, and at last, anti-nationalist line of uh, postmodern literature. And uh, uh, finally, to come back to the generation of Sretin Ugricic, uh, this group of young postmodernists from the 1980s found themselves above all intellectually saturated with the Yugoslav late socialist society in which they lived and sought above all to distance themselves from it without an immediate intention to critically deconstruct it. But however, this position of being ideologically indifferent was shattered until the early 1990s, where the ideological standpoints and preferences of the authors could be defined exclusively in their, or primarily, let's say, uh, in their relation uh, to the emerging ethnic nationalism as a new hegemonic axis in the political and literary arena. Although the majority of the postmodernist authors and critics found themselves on the opposite side in relation to the nationalist narratives and official state policies. Some of them, however, supported them, either openly or simply by maintaining a co comfortable cohabitation with Milosevic's uh, regime. It was an ideological fissure that literary postmodernism could not avoid and which could be retrospectively interpreted as the beginning of the end of the literary postmodernism uh, in Serbia. And this very process could be also traced in the works of Zretin Ugricic. Uh, his, uh, I will uh, name it a conceptual book, Infinitive, uh, published in 1997, could be seen as a transitional point uh, towards the works of the next decade, uh, when the collection of essays, Uvodu Astronomiu, Introduction into Astronomy, uh, published 2006, and the novel Neznano Munaku to an unknown hero, uh, published 2010, uh, were published. This transformation could also be described as a trajectory from a poetic, neo-romantic postmodernism towards a political neo-avant-garde novel and polemical essay, or in other words, as a transition from the time and space outside or before the written history in the first phase uh, through the phase of fictional or alternative history, right to the real history. So that at the end, this real history and its destructive nature absorb in itself even the real person of the writer and, in, and intellectual threaten of it. Thank you. Thank you, Goran. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, a person who uh, Goran mentioned at the beginning of uh, his talk. This is uh, Branislav Jakolevic, who is a professor at uh, Stanford University and also a professor at the European Graduate School. Uh, Branislav, in your text, uh, you devoted your attention to Ugric's latest novel, 
to The Unknown Hero, which was published in uh, 2010. I would like to ask you, how is this work connected to Ugarčić's previous works? And what makes this novel so rare in the context of Serbian literature of post-war and post-Yugoslav era? Thank you, Nemanja. Um, and uh, like uh, my, uh, like the previous speakers, I want to thank you and uh, Professor Fink's, uh, Finsk for organizing this event. Uh, also, to I want to thank uh, Svetlana and Sasha for their really relentless work and their perseverance in putting together this volume. But more than anything else, I want to thank you, Sreten, for being here with us today and for giving us this wonderful, wonderful works, uh, this, this uh, shining, really, spot of conscious that is still pulsating in uh, Belgrade, in Yugoslavia, and transpiring beyond that region. So, Sreten, I want to put your work um, in, in a larger context, in the context of the process of, um, actually, I want to just step back a moment and go back to, to um, a, a really interesting, a really series of talks and presentations that took place last year, last spring and summer, when a group of uh, uh, scholars from the former Yugoslavia organized uh, who are working mostly in Western Europe and in the US, they organized a series of talks called Youth Planning, uh, in which basically the, those were the last days of the Trump administration. And basically they looked at what happened in Yugoslavia as a way of, of explaining uh, the larger world political processes. And I think uh, that your work, Sreten, is one really can tell us something very important about the position of the writer and the position of the intellectual in larger political and social context of refeudalization of the public sphere which is happening not only in the former second world in Eastern Europe, but in the West and in the US. So this refeudalization of political and uh, public sphere in general can be seen as especially toxic and especially really injurious, especially devastating a really dimension of a larger neoliberal turn and neoliberal project. So I don't want to say that really, I, I don't think, I think it's a limiting uh, really approach to, to look at your work only in the context of Yugoslavia and the, in the context of Serbia and Belgrade and all of that. You are a living working writer working within a much larger context of, of contemporary, contemporary uh, um, uh, Western culture. So uh, having said all of that, I find very uh, significant the, and re, going back to your question, Nemanja, the, the coherence of your work threaten. So uh, as we, no, in this uh, Zoom room, it is um, relatively, relatively diverse output. There, you have written a couple of novels, stories, and essays, uh, and uh, uh, the two signposts in that that uh, output in that over are the two novels, uh, Infinitive, uh, which was published in 1997 and to an un unknown hero published in 2010. Um, and then before, in between and after, there are a number of uh, stories, essays, um, which stories and essays, which are kind of blurring the boundary between uh, theory 
and creative writing between philosophy and literature, which I find uh, extremely important. Uh, what brings this diverse work together is not the style. I would not call it the style. What brings the stories, the essays, the, the novels, all of these works together is not the style, but a certain really uh, relentless and persistent inquiry into the relationship between language and truth, between language, if you will, and ethics. And that's uh, something that I find uh, quite unique and quite important for this general, really, uh, literary work. And that opens the avenues, really, of communication between works that came early, the works that came later. There are all of these paths that go from one text to another. Uh, and uh, another thing that's really important there is the persistence, the persistence of what I would call an ethical maximalism. Just to, to um, think of the idea of, of uh, um, one of the ideas that run through infinitive is really the infinity of this ethical question of what is a value? How are the values constituted and what uh, really maintains these values? So this ethical maximalism reminds me very much of certain instances of literature from the 19th century. And uh, um, we recognize it in works which are really difficult to, to uh, pinpoint in a certain kind of genre, such as the stories and works generally, the works of Kierkegaard, of Nietzsche, of Dostoevsky. So I'm putting you a threaten in a, you know, quite elite company. But one big difference there is between your work and these works is that they are framing this ethical maximalism within a certain kind of narrative structure. Even Kierkegaard, you know, even these philosophical texts are profoundly narrative and vice versa, novelists at that time tend to really uh, insert philosophical question in, into a larger literary narration. What I find uh, really significant about this kind of work that is happening in this, in this neo-feudal moment is that it is not framing this ethical maximalism within a larger narrative structure, but within a certain kind of uh, really legacy and, and within and deploying certain kind of methods um, invented, devised by conceptual art of mid 20th century, what they refer to as language works, which in a certain kind of way really purifies the idea of language, sets the language, takes it out of this narrative flow and actually uh, establishes a certain kind of examines a relationship between the statement and the truth, the statement, linguistic statement and the larger ethical question which that statement has to engage in a certain kind of way. And that's what I think is bringing this work into this very unique point of inflection that happened in Serbia in, in a, a particular historical moment. And that is the historical moment of post-war really uh, uh, society. I will end by saying that every war takes place twice. It's, you know, uh, an obvious statement. The first time it takes place through armed conflict, the second time it takes place through discourse. The public discourse relives, restages, re, uh, really 
uh, organize, uh, re uh, inscribes the war into this extreme violence into a larger historical narrative. Uh, this work with linguistic statements, bringing them into closest possible relationship to the question of truth and ethics intervenes in that kind of really displacement of violence through uh, discourse that has been taking place in Serbia from the moment the last bomb exploded in that long war of, of the 1990s. Um, and uh, just one more small point, it's really interesting that the only peaceful transition of power in Serbian history, as far as I can remember, uh, took place in 2012. Why is that? Why did actually the only hot spot in that peaceful transition of power in 2012 was really the <laughs> uh, um, why was this incident with, with this public lynching of Sreten Ugricic the only hotspot in that peaceful transition of power? Precisely because really there is already an ideological continuity between previous and the new uh, um, political order that that supposedly transitioned, and this uh, really uh, a literary uh, work really brought into question that ideological continuum that was already established after the war in, in Serbia. Um, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Branislav. Uh, my next question is uh, for um, uh, Davor Beganovic, who is the lecturer in the Slavic Department of University of Tibingen, research fellow at the Slavic Department of University Minster, adjunct lecturer in the Slavic Department of University of Zurich and Slavic Department of University of Constance. Davor, the question that I have for you is actually threefold. Uh, you focused in your essay um, on Ugric's book of essays, Introduction to Astronomy, which was published in 2006. So what drew you to this precise book? Also, what was the response of this book to nationalism and totalitarianism? And did this response have anything to do with what happened to Sreten Ugric in 2012? Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the kind invitation to take part in this round. And uh, before I start uh, asking your, uh, answering your question, uh, I can't refrain uh, from uh, memories uh, which are uh, taking me to Belgrade in 2011. Uh, as I was uh, taken from the airport by Svetlana Gavrilovic, and uh, Sasha Ilic uh, on my way to the National Library uh, to deliver a note, uh, to deliver a um, lecture on, uh, I think, Mesha Selimovic. Uh, we were sitting in the car uh, on the Boulevard of Revolution and uh, it came uh, the message uh, on the radio that uh, Radko Mladic is uh, captured and arrested in uh, some uh, village in North Serbia. Uh, and uh, I can't uh, see any of uh, this coincidence. Uh, it's a, a, a terrible uh, analogy that uh, we are talking now here in this pandemic situation about uh, Sretin Ugršić, who is no more director of the National Library, and uh, about uh, this um, series of lectures, which was uh, organized by Sasha and Svetlana, and uh, which is taking, uh, which is uh, uh, not taking part anymore in this national uh, institution. How is this um, to um, be seen as a 
some sort of justice uh, by uh, today's um, verdict against uh, Radko Mladic. I uh, really don't know, but um, I can't say that I'm uh, very uh, satisfied, personally extremely satisfied uh, with uh, today's uh, verdict. If we are uh, thinking about the consequences of um, and uh, the position of uh, uh, Mladic in uh, the contemporary um, Serbian society. Uh, but um, anyway, to, to ask a question, um, uh, I actually wrote about two books um, uh, about um, introduction to astronomy and uh, life is a foreign country. And um, why I choose uh, this, um, these two books, um, the reason was that um, I wrote extensively about um, an unknown uh, hero uh, in uh, 2012, I think. 2013, um, and um, I um, wrote a couple of reviews about other uh, certain uh, books. So I said, uh, why not uh, these two books of essays? Uh, the first reason uh, to write about it is um, uh, twofold. Uh, Sretin Ugricic is uh, from uh, education and um, and uh, from a vocation, a philosopher himself. And there is, uh, Bata has been talking about it, um, there is a, some sort of um, uh, hybridization in um, his books of um, these two discourses. And um, Bata put him in one uh, tradition of um, 19th century. Uh, I would try to put in this uh, short presentation, uh, threaten in the tradition of philosophical tradition of uh, 20th century and in the philosophical tradition of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, that, was, that was my uh, first, first reason uh, to, to write about these uh, two books. Uh, on the other side, um, I was, I was um, uh, led by idea that this uh, introduction to astronomy has um, some sort of very uh, structured um, position uh, between ethical and aesthetical questions. And there are, uh, there is one essay, it, it is, uh, that was put in between of the ethical and aesthetical uh, questions, mixturing uh, uh, of two discourses. Uh, I didn't write uh, about um, Medirate, uh, which is um, some sort of my guilt, uh, but um, the place uh, I was given uh, was not that uh, long and I have to short myself. So uh, uh, I, discussed mostly in Introduction uh, to Astronomy, uh, the essays uh, concerning with this ethical uh, uh, question. Uh, if we uh, uh, look at uh, the infinitive, uh, we can say that it's, um, and uh, you wrote about it too, Nemanja, if I can uh, remember, uh, it's a, in a, in a way, uh, highly entangled uh, philosophical treatise too. And therefore, uh, out of this vocation and out of this education uh, is uh, Ugricic, an author uh, who is collecting uh, in two books, the essays uh, which could be put in the genre, very specific genre of the philosophical essay. No? Uh, this uh, book, uh, I'm talking about uh, introdu introduction to astronomy now, uh, uh, which is extremely uh, stimulating, uh, complicated, sophisticated, and demanding attempt. Uh, and attempt uh, is the original uh, meaning of the word essay itself. Uh, attempt in philosophical explanation and interpretation of the world. Not that much of Serbia, but of world in general. Uh, uh, the second uh, book, The Life is Foreign Country, follows the similar way. Uh, but uh, just 
shortly uh, to uh, uh, um, describe uh, the poetic uh, constructions hidden uh, behind uh, these uh, two books and two uh, uh, in this genre that uh, Umbricic is uh, using. It's a uh, uh, very uh, highly abstract level of discussion. Of discussion. Uh, the discourse discusses uh, virulent questions of uh, political life in contemporary Serbia, but it tries not to mention them uh, directly. Uh, in a sense, it is avoiding uh, apart from a couple of names uh, which are um, impossible of, uh, to avoid, uh, such as Slobodan Milosevic or uh, Dobrica Ciosic, uh, Sreten is trying to avoid the direct mentioning of the names of the actors of um, tragical events uh, that took part in Yugoslavia at the end of the 20th century. And in this sense, uh, these essays are uh, critical on the heritage of Balkan wars and uh, they are at the same time posing the questions which are concerning the contemporary life. The contemporary life not only in Serbia but in general. We'll see this especially in the book uh, Life is a Foreign Economy. Uh, so, what is philosophical in uh, these essays? I would say that Sreten Ungricic, uh, in the best tradition of Ludwig Wittgenstein, and I would uh, have to quote uh, Wittgenstein shortly, uh, uh, he says um, at, uh, in, the, in the introduction to Tractatus Logicus Philosophicus, uh, was sich überhaupt sagen lässt, lässt sich klar sagen. Und wovon man nicht reden kann, darüber muss man schweigen. Uh, so try to translate uh, Wittgenstein. Uh, 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 something that uh, could be said at all, uh, it could be said clearly. And something uh, about, man, uh, about uh, the uh, one can't uh, speak uh, about this, you have to be silent. So, uh, Sreten Ugricic is silent about quite a lot of questions because uh, he is sure that he has to speak only about the things he can say, only about the things he knows, and he knows quite a lot. So, his uh, language, his speech is extremely rich in this, in this sense uh, of, the, of the world. Uh, Ugricic, and here is the another uh, connection uh, with, uh, with Wittgenstein, uh, he aims at the, uh, at the particular words, considers them in respective contexts, give their definition, in order to uncover their hidden meaning or its figurative application. Therefore, are the essays of Ugricic, in a sense, full of the rhetorical uh, uh, questions, full of uh, rhetorical problems and uh, full of explanation on concrete rhetorical figures, such as metaphor, or tautology, not just the two of them. Uh, in this way, uh, he discovers specific rhetoric quality of every language. Let me just mention two crucial uh, words uh, they, that are uh, uh, dominating uh, the two books of um, Sreten Ugricic. The first one is slichnos, which is similarity. Uh, the second one is odgovornost, which is responsibility. Now, uh, why is the similarity so important in the philosophical vision of Sreten Ugricic? Similarity is important because 
it is a sort of, a, of an opposite to identity. And on the other side, it is a sort of opposite to the difference. So if we are talking about the similarity, we are talking about something which is taking royal position between two opposed questions or two opposed to uh, two opposed ways ways of putting the question, and uh, that are um, in this sort. Of, if we are thinking similarities, we are avoiding the identity. And the identity is uh, something uh, which creates equality. Uh, and this equality leads to exertion of discipline on the people. That's the crucial point of Sretan Uricic in his discussion of, uh, uh, of the word identity. Uh, the highly modern, uh, highly uh, mostly positive loaded word, which is uh, turning uh, in not, not in the positivity, but in negativity of um, his uh, specific philosophical discourse of Ugricic. And his, uh, uh, um, if I can say conclusion, is that this sort of identity is leading to fascism. And if we are trying to avoid fascism, we have to we have to think in the similarities. The second word is responsibility. Uh, that's the question uh, uh, which is uh, leading Svetlana Ugricic to the great uh, thinkers of the 20th century, uh, Hannah Arendt in the first place, and in which uh, Svetlana Ugricic tries to uh, solve uh, the great problem, is there a collective responsibility of the people for the deeds uh, which are uh, made uh, by uh, leadership of the people. And that's, the set, that's the, another moment leading to the question of the guilt. And he says very openly that he feels guilty for the deeds of Slobodan Milosevic and, uh, and, his, and his regime. So uh, just short, uh, uh, last remark. Uh, it is, uh, for me, it seems important to see uh, that there is a different, slight difference between these two books of essays. In the introduction to astronomy, behind uh, the irony, uh, behind the critical language, uh, behind the uh, high level of criticism, directed towards Serbian society, there is a sort of optimistic discourse. There is a hope. And the life is a foreign country. And that's the book written, uh, I don't think written, but published um, after that, uh, what uh, happened uh, to uh, Sretan Ugricic is, an, is a completely pessimistic book. It's a book uh, that have uh, in uh, one of its crucial essays, the theme of, or uh, the, the scene of being broken. No? And he is talking about uh, three peril, uh, that's uh, what uh, Bata uh, said, uh, there is a sort of narrativity in the philosophical texts of Sretan Ugricic, of course, is telling us three stories of the three different people being broken in different societies, in Germany, in Switzerland, and in the USA. And uh, now, my uh, uh, last analogy is that the middle person of uh, this being broken and uh, it happens about one broken table is American philosopher and author, David Foster Wallace. That is a part of the essay dedicated to an American who wrote his, uh, if I'm right, um, 
master thesis on Ludwig Wittgenstein. And uh, I think that that's um, an, uh, one extremely important moment in uh, the, for the future uh, research in the work of uh, Svetlana Kličić. Thank you. Thank you, Davor. Uh, finally, we come to Sveten himself. And uh, Sveten, you heard everything that was said so far. Feel free to respond if you would like to say something. But also, from this distance right now that is both temporal and physical, almost 10 years have passed since the events that were mentioned. And also, you're not living in Serbia anymore. Uh, how do you see and how do you feel about uh, everything that happened, everything that transpired? Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Nemanja and Professor Pinsk, to, for organizing this event. Then, of course, uh, to thank from the bottom of my heart to Svetlana Gavrilović and Sasha Ilić to compose this uh, book. And, and finally, to each of you who contributed to that book and today to this uh, discussion. Thank you, Lorne, from Latin of my uh, Now to try to answer and to comment some of things mentioned already here. First, because I know that our audience today is not only people from Serbia. I would like to suggest to everybody who is listening now that here, Serbia is not just political, geographic, and historic entity. It should be considered in the context of this discussion as a, as a label for a specific uh, state of mind and the way of life. And which now currently becomes more and more recognizable global. And uh, I hope that people who are listening can recognize these some elements of that in the, what we are talking now, assumedly talking about me and sir. It's not only about that. Uh, also, you mentioned distance. I, uh, it's true there is distance in time and in space from which I'm talking to all of you now. And uh, this brings the, the issue of exile into my mind and, and thinking reflection. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's, I would like to emphasize something about exile, which is uh, in, in reflecting about nations or peoples. Okay, I work, for example, for one institution which has this category of people in its name. It's, it was people's library. It was not national library, you know, for example. So uh, what I want to uh, uh, focus your attention a little bit towards the three dimensions of this category of people. Uh, it's, uh, of course, just sum total in one dimension is just sum total of uh, all who belong, all citizens. No? The second dimension is those, when we say folk, when we say people, we think also very much about 
those who are this uh, uh, who are uh, uh, without real um, capital, how to say this, they are um, dispossessed, okay, and uh, poor and so-called ordinary common people. This is another meaning of this uh, tricky category. And the third is this which has to do with exile. And this category is also defined with those who are expelled. So I, I would say in a, if you want, philosophical way that those who belong are defined by those who don't belong. Okay, and usually this is neglected, this is uh, uh, forgotten, this dimension. And in case of Serbia, I can prove it very simply. Serbia at that time and even today is defined by exactly those who are not there. For example, Serbia is defined by assassin Zoran Djindjic, prime minister. Serbia is defined by uh, 800,000 Albanians, which were uh, forced to leave uh, Kosovo in the war uh, during 1999, for example. Also, Serbia is defined by children which resist to be born there. By this, I'm referring to some phenomenon which is usually called in Serbia, Bela Kuga, white pest, which wants to describe this, uh, this catastrophe of losing this uh, population, no? that every year in Serbia, one city of approximately 50,000 people is disappearing. No? Serbia is defined by them, them also, these children who resist to, to be born. And of course, by these many uh, young people of today who simply don't see their future there and uh, uh, try by any means to go away, to go abroad and to continue their life out. So these are some thoughts for me from the distance. Because in your question, you mentioned this and uh, I, I wanted to reflect on that. Also, I wanted to, to comment a little bit about in, uh, also in uh, very general terms, what was that force which forced me to leave? You know? And of course, I was thinking a lot uh, in the aftermath about that. And if I have to reduce this in a very condensed form, I could define it as a very concrete type of attitude, which sounds a little bit like this. You and others like you, you are wrong even when you are right and even when you do right. And we, we are right even when we are wrong and when we do wrong. This attitude is somehow, if I articulate it, hopefully for you to understand it, was, uh, was the core of what forced me to into exile. You know? 
for them, even when you are doing good, you, you are doing bad. And why is that? It's not because of, uh, of the content of the meanings, which are, let's say, opposite. You can say they are dogmatic and totalitarian and authoritarian, and uh, supposedly I am democratic, tolerant, and things like that. It's not about that opposition. Uh, um, Anything I would say or do for them or people like me would be bad and wrong. Because the principle of their attitude and my attitude and those who, is, who are minority in Serbia and in similar countries uh, uh, who, who are like, like me. Because the principle of their convictions and attitudes and behavior is the principles and assumptions are opposite. And not the, the content of the meanings are the ideological, poetical, political, or whatever. So this means that whatever I do, it or people like me, it confirms this irreducible difference, which is somehow unbearable for them, okay? Because it invalidates everything which drives them in that attitude which I tried to, to articulate before. So, the, these assumptions of their attitude, of that attitude is basic, based on, of course, on non-thinking, on obedience, or on avoiding uh, responsibility, on uh, denial of responsibility, uh, on very narrow horizon of uh, imagination. So these are, these are these assumptions behind that, that kind of attitude, which is unfortunately prevailing. And it prevails also in what, uh, what uh, Branislav was talking uh, uh, when he was talking about re-feudalization, uh, which is this, obviously global, in my view at least, uh, a, a global uh, manifestation of regression uh, of our civilization. And also this, these assumptions are crucial for what uh, uh, Olga was talking, uh, mentioning this ideology of uh, impunity and politics of impunity, because this illusion of impunity is, is uh, crucial here. <clears throat> Nationalism, for example, but it can be also some other ideologies, uh, is so powerful to manipulate uh, with, with the uh, majority's mind because it offers the illusion of impunity. Whatever the illusion that whatever they do, uh, there will be no consequences for it. Okay, in the, in the case of Serbian nationalism, it would be enough just to be, to be Serbian nationalist, and then just because of that, any deed or any word or any action that kind of person uh, does becomes, becomes free of consequence and, and guarantees 
uh, in their view, guarantees impunity. And, and this, this is the maybe the strongest drugs of all drugs. Mm. This is why, why they believe that, you know, they, uh, the nationalists believe that they rule even if they are ruled. For example, Serbian nationalists believe that they rule in Serbia simply because they are Serbs. No? Where in fact, of course, kleptocracy and corruption rules. And this, this, uh, e, uh, this uh, uh, in injection, this hub of, of mafia, politicians, uh, media, uh, and big business is in rule, of course. So uh, these are some, some, uh, some thoughts which come to my mind uh, listening your, your contributions and, and thoughts regarding uh, so-called case or event of threatening uh, I don't know what else I can say, but uh, uh, there is also maybe just to make a kind of resume or of, of the whole affair, there are three three um, uh, dominant mo moments in the whole story, at least from this distance, I can see them. One would be this cruelty and ruthlessness of the, the whole uh, media spin which took place during the pre-election uh, campaign of that time, nine years ago. Uh, and I came into the, this hot red spot focus, which was uh, for them very useful to be misused. And uh, they applied, employed the full spectrum of uh, state apparatus uh, uh, to do it. And the uh, second moment was, the, of course, the issue of uh, freedom of speech and uh, expression and human rights, which I was defending by very simple gesture of signing uh, this uh, letter of support to another writer. You know? And uh, I did it in a, in, in a, on behalf of a, a triple justification from my side. And I was defending it as a citizen. I was defending it as a writer and I was defending it as a director of National Library of the institution, which has in its statute and program as a, one of the basic uh, a programmatic goals, uh, defense and protection of, of freedom of speech. Uh, but regardless, exactly because of that, I was severely attacked and even threatened by minister of police to be arrested. You know? And the third mo uh, uh, moment of the whole story uh, was uh, this uh, this debate kind of or or uh, ambiguity uh, of this what happened between uh, me as a writer and me as a civil uh, public servant as a manager and leader of the uh, main national 
cultural institution. I, I mean, the, the, the third point was the question of can I or anybody like me engage myself into a public debate with the with the statements, attitudes, and policies which are not in accordance with the official or dominant uh, policies of the government. The problem with this third third uh, moment is that there was no explicit, never, and still there is no such a thing, uh, official governmental position or you should you can say that there is no still there something like explicit cultural strategy or cultural policy document or vision or, or anything like that it is and it is not by coincidence that it's like that that it is unsaid it, it is applied very consistently and in today times to, it, to the very radical uh, consequences throughout the whole uh, realm of, in this case, uh, uh, culture and art, but it is never, it was never articulated explicitly. There was this uh, hypocrisy there going on all the time and still is going on. On one side, uh, officially politicians would come and declare themselves devoted to these universal values, but uh, in reality on everyday basis, they were in fact employing uh, hardcore National ethno clero nationalistic ideology uh, on all levels. So these uh, these three moments were somehow uh, there from the retrospective view for me. Uh, those who who created the biggest um, ambiguity and. Uh, and controversy uh, are around around this case. So this is uh, what uh, what would be my my thoughts. Ah uh, yes, and also coming back to this to this um, uh, attitude, which is in the core of this what I call Serbia as a state of mind and way of life. It is based, of course, on, and some of you mentioned this, which I noticed even before, but now I just want to con uh, confirm this, based on the denial and oblivion, denial of responsibility, uh, for what happened in the 90s and even for what happened in 2003 with killing of Jinjic, for example, and what is happening now. So full, full denial is the, in fact, the only consistent strategy and, and the policy and the, the goal there. And it is basically denial of uh, conscience and consciousness, both. So uh, somehow majority simply indulges themselves into this denial of conscience and consciousness. And, and I was shocked, one personal remark regarding this, I was shocked, it took me really 
more than 40 years of my life to realize this very basic truth about majority of people. They are not interested in truth or justice or uh, things like that, you know, uh, somehow. They prefer lies and they prefer uh, injustice. You know? I was shocked to finally realize this during night. And any ideology which somehow give them the, the free card or a license to be the worst of them in that respect is received and uh, with uh, enormous gratitude and majority, unfortunately, um, give away themselves into it uh, without limit. And basically that, that prevailing attitude and culture and uh, if you want social uh, relations and uh, state of mind is, which I would say not only in Serbia, but now spreading uh, almost, we can say, global. Thank you again, all of you, for, for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Sedin. And uh, thank, uh, my thanks go to all other panelists. Uh, we have no questions from the audience. And therefore, I think it would be nice uh, for the end of this uh, event uh, to give uh, the opportunity to Professor Finsk either to ask certain something or to give uh, any kind of commentary for uh, the things that uh, he heard uh, tonight. Thank you. Um, thank you, all of you. Uh, um, I, I have to imagine that if there are no questions, it's because people feel a bit like I do. I, um, I feel a bit overwhelmed. Um, something has uh, uh, transpired in this discussion. Uh, it, has, it has built in, a, in an extraordinary way. I mean, each step has been important in putting in place, for me, the, uh, the incredible significance of Sretan's words. You know, I, I, each of you has, have made, um, for me, contributions that were really very rich, very uh, thought-provoking. At one point, I thought, I, I want to go, I want to read, I, I wish more were translated and so forth, but I have a hunger to learn more about what, uh, uh, what you know, Sretan's work. Um, I know some of it, thank, thanks to Nemanja, um, and because I've had the pleasure of listening to him, but uh, I feel a tremendous hunger for, for more, uh, I have to say, and, and, and today's discussion has helped to provoke that. But I also feel um, you know, the significance of, of what we have discussed today is just immense. And I, I have felt this, uh, you know, that, that Svetan's remark, Serbia is a state of mind. I, I have been very aware of this um, in my position, you know, I'm from very far away in North America, but uh, I know, uh, you know, I, I know uh, with deep, uh, that, uh, you know, a sense of trouble, uh, the extent to which the Trump administration saw in Serbia uh, and the current regime an ally and, uh, and why they did that. And the continuity with what we have experienced and continue to experience with what Svetan, what you have described in terms of this, um, this construction of power that, that, that has, uh, has taken shape today, where we have this illusion of impunity that you're describing. Um, I, I, if I had, a, if I, had, if I were to have a question, I, I'm not sure. I want to. I feel, I feel humble in this situation. I don't know that I'm in a position to speak, but I, I, my question would be, how do we understand the, the, well, I would say the potential novelty of this situation? Or in your last words, you seem to. I now understand that, that the majority wants illusion, but I, I, I can't get over the feeling that there is something new taking shape. In, in the last decade or so. Um, 
that in this construction of power, where the, as you described it so um, powerful today, um, uh, so so insightfully, um, there is something there is something uh, there is something new. I, I I always go back, you know, in my imagination to uh, a, you know, a period in the earlier 20th century, say, where there were cosmopolitan centers where people were able to subsist um, in, in in relative uh, harmony, maybe in a sense of similarity, <laughs> so, you know, as in terms of their human uh, uh, needs and, and desires and, and, and so forth. Um, and I, 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 I look at, you know, I look at places, you know, Cairo or wherever, uh, places where there were, there were, there was subsistence and, and, and even a flourishing of, of multiplicity. You know, I, I recently heard someone describe Brooklyn. They say, oh, no place is richer than Brooklyn with all the people, uh, uh, you know, the people's living together. Unfortunately, they all hate each other, but that's okay. You know, and, and this, there was a certain joy in saying, this. we have a little bit of this today. But uh, in this little enclave, almost, but um, you know, globally we see a closure. We see this extraordinary formation that you you have uh, been describing. And so I I don't know I don't I, and, and so I, I don't necessarily want to launch a discussion in that direction. I just want to note it. And I think I, I want to say that you have uh, described this and, and all of you together and in. in, in the, Building of this discussion that I've been trying to allude to, you have described a situation that is that is um, incredibly thought provoking and, uh, and leaves me with an immense question. Um, I don't know, Svetlana, if you want to uh, uh, respond or if anybody wants to respond or add to you know, my impression of what's happened today. But um, I, I, to me, I'm, I'm very moved and I'm deeply moved and, and thankful to all of you, actually. Okay. Uh... What first comes to my mind is cynicism, is a new dimension to it. This is what I was trying to describe, of course, took place always, takes place always. But, uh, I think that, and I believe that before this, this uh, element or aspect of cynical attitude integrated into it was no there or very marginal in previous times and epochs where now it is dominant, which means for me that all of this is going on with no sense or no no real commitment to it. from neither from from the majority which obeys and follows nor from those who are uh, pushing it who are are uh, manipulating and spinning it okay and uh, it I believe that it's a, it's it's an age of uh, on one side uh, how you say ravnodushnos? Uh, Can anybody help me? Indifference. Uh, indifference, yes. And on the other side, there is this prevailing uh, feeling or experience of distrust mm. nobody believes in anything anymore really this for me is uh, maybe new if you ask that uh, it was in a in a way and uh, partly uh, part of the story even before but now this I would say is somehow dominant. And uh, this creates some kind of emptiness, which is really horrifying. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if it can last uh, and how long it can last. 
I'm totally puzzled because in some moments I intend to think this cannot last long. This is so, so uh, crazy, so dangerous, so self-destructive that uh, uh, that it will explode any moment. On the on then in in in, in next thoughts. I also can give an argument that exactly because it's like that, without any uh, uh, fundament in it, it can last forever. Like that, no. Mm -hmm. So these maybe were would be some elements there which are for me now uh, prevailing and define it. Mm -hmm. Of course, anybody else can. Sretin, as much as I admire you and your work, I will have to beg to disagree. Um, <laughs> I don't think that the situation is that desperate. You know, seeing this, what, eight faces on, the, on this Zoom, um, engaging in a um, conversation about true and uh, truth and value and ethics, that's already something, you know, it's not like, you know, we don't believe in anything. We believe in, believe in some basic fundamental really standards of uh, ethics, truth uh, and um, disagreement after all. Um, and if there are another, you know, 30 people, that's a lot, really. That, that's already something. So, um, indeed, we are in, the, in a period of a major, deep, tectonic, ideological shift through which the, the really Western societies are going. Uh, but, you know, that is a major challenge. And... Uh, um, something will come, an insight will come from that crisis, for sure. Okay. Now you remind me of one, maybe uh, I am allowed now to tell you a little anecdote from my life, which maybe has something to do with what now we are talking about. I was an uh, assistant at the university in Pristina at that time, and uh, the invitation from Belgrade came to give a, a lecture, public lecture at the Dom Omladine, the, the youth center in Belgrade. There was one philosopher there who was organizing a philosophical tribune there. And uh, he organized one uh, series of lectures dealing with nihilism. And he invited me to give a lecture myself. And I prepared my lecture, uh, came there. There were very few audience, maybe 15 people, not more, just philosophers, no? And I, I was talking for hour and a half, maybe more, about one American philosopher, contemporary American philosopher, Stuart W. Greenchurch and his theory of values for an hour and a half. That was before I, was, I published the book, you know, Infinity, later on, because the book came out of that lecture. So after, so the, the whole talk was about values. What are the values, how they can be constituted and all of this. And what is the highest value of all and all of this? And then when I finished, there were some questions from the audience, a few questions. And uh, when uh, I reply to those questions, then I ask audience, but you didn't ask me the, the key question for tonight. And then this moderator asked, but what, what would be that key question? And I said, but this is the serious 
under title nihilism and I talked all evening about values. So how, how can this be? This is contradiction. You, I missed my whole topic, no? And, and why nobody from you asked me this, challenged me with that? And if nobody still challenges me with that, I will reply myself to this question. You know what I said at the end, all of this theory and the, the, the philosopher I was talking about, I invented him. He doesn't exist. So this was my contribution to the uh, talk about nihilism there. Uh, so we maybe now are there in a, in a civilization which can only imagine values, maybe remember them. So, or maybe I am uh, radically pessimistic or how you said maximum uh, 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 maximalizing ethical uh, yeah. approach. Ethical something. maximalism. Maximalism. For me, this is ethical minimalism because this comes to the most basic. But the very most basic basic is missing there, and uh, and that's the problem. In your own work, you you talked Sretan about the capacity to imagine the capacity of imagination. And that's really the first step, really going beyond these really chimeras, these kind of illusions, ideological really constructs that, that are really uh, completely illusionary on one hand and on the other hand, deeply integrated into uh, a material existence. That's what's limiting the, the really the, this capacity to imagine, capacity to imagine something different yet similar to the world in which we live. Um, yeah, um, I, I will have to check out um, soon. I have another meeting, so I'll, I'll just I, I'll use this opportunity to thank you again and to thank everyone. Thank you. So we are already at the time limit. So I believe that this discussion uh, would be a nice way to end this uh, event. I uh, would like uh, once again to thank uh, everyone uh, who uh, participated, everyone who contributed and uh, all people who were in the attendance. And uh, I hope to see you all uh, again at the future events that uh, the EGS is organizing. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.